Hi everyone, I've been wanting to do this video for a while, so today's the day. I've been thinking in many respects, I think the push by governments primarily for EV vehicles in lieu of internal combustion engine vehicles has gotten ahead of a lot of engineering. And uh, I wanna talk about that here today. I wanna also talk about what the problems are, who's active in the marketplace, and some current and pending U.S. regulation and policy that's going to probably upend the entire market, but we'll see. we'll see. We'll just go through it here at a bit at a time. Now, I saw this article recently where a crash test reveal that highway guardrails failed to protect Tesla Rivian EV vehicles. And I guess the idea is that these vehicles are much heavier because of their battery pack than a traditional ICE engine sedan or truck. The thing that bothered me about this article is they really didn't compare it to, say, a, a pickup truck or SUV. So I'm a little skeptical about this, but it does point out the relationship between new EV design and highway protective measures in terms of guardrails and other considerations, roadway striping and that sort of thing. Now, EV sales are continuing to increase. I think the big driver of this is, again, government policy because of tax credits. Uh, available to people who buy certain EV models. Also, the U.S. manufacturers early on were very enthusiastic about switching to EVs. Again, I'm not sure I understand the reason for that, except for the fact that perhaps it's cheaper to build an EV from a labor standpoint. Certainly when you eliminate a transmission, that's a costly component to a conventional vehicle that you don't have to deal with on an EV. Now, here's another technical concern I've seen come up in the news media from time to time, and that's the question of parking garages, if they're structurally sound to handle heavier EVs. So, for example, a typical EV weighs about 2,000 pounds more than a conventional ICE engine vehicle. But then again, a lot of times these indoor parking garages were built before the big increase in usage of pickup trucks, and large SUVs. So again, on this front, I'm also skeptical that this is much of a problem, but the trend is concerning, and I think people need to keep an eye on it because eventually, if widespread EV use is adopted, certainly the overall loads on these parking structures are going to increase relative to what could have been anticipated during the original design. I would say the biggest concern relative to parking garages and EVs is that of fire suppression systems. I don't think uh, any of these parking garages were designed with EVs in mind, as the fires tend to be far more intense and much harder to put out. And, you know, you can read various statistics. I was always skeptical about the overall life cycle carbon emission for an EV versus an ICE vehicle. But I came across this article, which points out that technically EVs are not zero emission vehicles because the tires produce a lot of particulate matter. And the biggest reason for that is that these vehicles are, are heavier than a normal vehicle, but the tire technology has largely remained unchanged. These are essentially light duty tires. So the EV tires are worn at a much higher rate. So mile per mile, they're throwing up way more particulates than the tires from a conventional ICE vehicle. Now, full disclosure, I'm pretty much a gas and oil guy. I have several motorcycles, and my other vehicles either have a turbo or a V8 in them. There was a time where I considered buying an EV, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't, because where I live in the Midwest, the charging infrastructure is wholly inadequate for the long-distance driving that I often do. So again, I, I'm going to be as objective and unbiased, and unbiased as possible in this video. I'm just laying it out where, where my feelings lie. I think... Uh, the government may have gotten way too far ahead of consumers as well as the manufacturing industry on this EV push. But let's go through a few more uh, bits of information here. Now, a fair question is whether Chinese-made electric vehicles are poised to become the predominant market share in various countries, including the United States. And the answer to that question, based on my research, is it's very much a real possibility because... China has been working on completely integrating 
all aspects of the supply chain for EV production. So the minerals for the battery, the battery production, everything that goes into making an EV. And they're poised now to be able to ship EVs at a much lower price point than say what can be made by competing American companies. Now for many Americans, that could be a relief because a lot of people have been priced out of a new vehicle, particularly a new EV. They tend to be far more expensive than a comparable internal combustion engine vehicle, even with the tax credits. So you combine the prospect of the Chinese essentially dumping EVs into the United States market with overall decline in interest in EVs here in the United States. So we've seen headline after headline where American companies are scaling back their production of EV vehicles. In fact, Tesla has laid off 10% of their workforce and they're dramatically scaling back and lowering prices at the same time to try and increase demand for their vehicles. So to give you an idea of how many EVs we're talking about, in 2023, there were US sales of 1.2 million EVs, which was a record. And that was up from 5.9% in 2022. So it went to 7.6% of all new vehicles sold. This chart shows you the distribution of EVs by manufacturer, BMW at 12.5%, and Toyota at 0.5%. And Toyota took a lot of heat for not embracing EVs. And from an engineering standpoint and overall market standpoint, it looks like Toyota was way ahead of the game. Instead of uh, going the EV route, they instead pushed their hybrid models, which remain to be the most popular models that you can buy out there today. And here's a chart showing you the dark blue is EVs and the light blue is hybrids. And year to year, you can see the increase shipments of hybrids. Hybrids have a lot of advantages. They definitely have much less emissions than a conventional ICE engine vehicle. You usually have tremendous range on them. There's a lot more technology that goes into them and that has to be taken into consideration. But from an engineering standpoint, I think it's far more preferable to have a hybrid than it is an electric vehicle. So the question is, if China's making such cheap EVs, and we're talking upwards of $10,000, and even if you double that price to $20,000, that's much cheaper than the typical EV that you could buy elsewhere that's well upwards of $35,000. Well, the answer to that question is, the uh, Trump administration imposed a 25% tariff on China-made electric vehicles, that tariff now stands at 27.5%. It was extended by the Biden administration. And we can see now there's a big push to repatriate a lot of important industrial production here back to the United States from overseas. We have a push in chip manufacturing for, for high-end applications, the push for build-out of EV battery plants. I have to admit that one of my most profitable projects in 2023 was for some foundation-related testing for a new EV battery plant under construction in my part of the world. They're talking that that plant could cost upwards of $4 billion to construct. So there's money trickling down throughout the economy for this EV push. But there's a broader context here is that there was a Gallup poll conducted recently, and most Americans consider China to be our biggest geopolitical rival in the world. Recent headlines would confirm this. You've got the pending TikTok ban that was signed by President Biden. TikTok has about one and a half years to divest of Chinese ownership or else be banned in the US altogether. And then four years ago, the FCC directed US cellular carriers to remove any Chinese made equipment from Huawei or ZTE. And that's resulted in some outages across the country, particularly in rural parts of the country. And this removal has to be completed by 2025. Congress appropriated $1.9 million to allow these operators to recoup the changeout costs, but it turns out they're gonna need another $3 billion to actually make it happen. So that funding has not been forthcoming yet, so we'll see what happens there. The other thing you have is a proposed ban on DJI drones that are made in China. Those drones can't be used 
by federal agencies. And there's a concern again about privacy and national security by having a tremendous amount of video throughout the United States that would be accessible to China. So in this context, you have Senator Josh Hawley from Missouri proposing an increase in the tariffs on China-made EVs to 125%, which would in essence double the price of a China-made EV. Then you have Senator Sherrod Brown from Ohio. He's proposing an outright ban on China-made EVs altogether, mostly from a standpoint of national security. And I'll read you this quote here. He talks about how influx of Chinese EVs would decimate the U.S. domestic manufacturing base. But he also goes on to say, it's just not the potential damage to U.S. auto industry that has prompted this letter. Brown wrote that he is concerned about the risk of China having access to data collected by connected cars, whether it be information about traffic patterns, critical infrastructure, or the lives of Americans. He also points out that China does not allow American-made electric vehicles near their official buildings. So as we know, uh, EVs, particularly something like a Tesla, is essentially a rolling computer and many of them have extensive camera systems. A typical Tesla has nine cameras, and this is done to facilitate driver-assisted or perhaps later on fully autonomous driving. But again, talking about government policy getting ahead of the engineering, the state of California recently banned all self-driving vehicles because of some mishaps that have occurred there. So this reminds me of another aspect of the green energy push that's concerned me and that's the push for solar farms in parts of the country where they're really not very suitable or very efficient. Again, from an engineering standpoint, Kansas is ranked 44th out of 50 in terms of viability of solar energy on these farms. But that hasn't stopped people, developers, from going in and taking some of the best farmland in the world and taking it out of production so that they can install acres and acres of solar panels most of these solar panels are made in China, by the way, although there are tax credits available for people using U.S.-made solar panels. Again, the majority of solar panels are coming from China. You know, talking about, the, from an engineering standpoint, the viability of solar in Kansas, I often do vibration monitoring for construction projects, and I have a seismograph that's connected to a battery, and the battery is recharged uh, from a solar panel that's on the enclosure for this equipment, and in the winter, I'm always having to go out and swap batteries because the solar panel can't keep up with, with the charge on the battery because of cloud cover, snow cover, that sort of thing. The other thing in Kansas is that power isn't too cheap there to begin with, and solar panel is more expensive typically than other forms of energy production. Now, every time I do a video, even remotely critical of China policy or China engineering, I get a bunch of... I call them bots, but I guess people that are sympathetic to the Chinese Communist Party just light me up in the comments section. So we'll see if that happens here. I did a video about what we know and what we don't know about the Three Gorges Dam in China from a safety standpoint. And ironically, I've only done three China-related videos, and I've got over 70 videos related to American projects. So I'm an equal opportunity person when it comes to calling out engineering challenges and mess ups and things like that, but uh, doesn't seem to be appreciated uh, on the other side of the world. And there seems to be a pattern too of China takeover of various U.S. industries. And sometimes it takes the U.S. quite a bit of time to reverse those trends due to national security or other issues. And a case in point is the extent that China has taken over a large aspect of filmmaking uh, here in the United States, whether it's film production or distribution. Now, so far, there's no talk of making the Chinese divest of those investments, but it has reportedly influenced studios in terms of the type of content they make and how China-friendly it may or may not be. So I'd like to send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. I also would like to send a shout out to those of you who have provided super thanks. And also to the, those of you who have liked, subscribed, and left comments. I'm really learning a lot from the comments, so please keep them up. 
Thanks very much for watching, everyone, and please stay tuned for future videos.